Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents Potato Bargaining with Gordon Schaefer, Chief Negotiator for the National Farmers Organization, and Del Little, Head of NFO Specialty Crops. Here now for U.S. Farm Report is Gordon Schaefer. We appreciate the opportunity to appear on this program today. As previously stated, I am Gordon Schaefer, Chief Negotiator, the National Farmers Organization, and Administrative Assistant to Orrin Lee Staley, our National President. As most of you folks probably know, the National Farmers Organization is a relatively new farm group. We've actually only been working on our bargaining approach a few short years. In the beginning, the NFO was nothing more than a protest movement, but after a couple of years of this type of an approach, the membership realized that we needed a do-it-yourself approach to the farm program. As a result, at our third annual convention, the officers of the organization were directed to come up with a program of collective bargaining for agriculture. Now this was a good big job to be assigned to a group of people because nothing like this had ever been tried before in the United States. But after studying what little bargaining was being tried and after talking to many, many people all over the United States, the officers, the organization did put together a program of collective bargaining for agriculture a program which would cover all commodities, a program under which we could be bargaining nationwide on all products so that prices could be brought up more or less simultaneously on all products. Now, in just a short time, comparatively speaking, our organization has grown until we now are organizing in 45 of the 48 states on the continent. We believe that much progress has been made. We think that the total bargaining effort is proceeding satisfactorily. Last fall, the California farmer, one of the leading farm magazines in the nation, ran a survey in California asking farmers which bargaining groups they thought were doing most in the field of bargaining. In this particular survey, the NFO ran second. The Raisin Bargaining Association of California was listed first as being the most outstanding bargaining group in the state of California, according to the farmers in the state of California. We in NFO have always been looking for and anxious to locate people who had knowledge in bargaining. And as a result, we're always trying to locate people that can assist us in our effort. We have with us tonight, as was previously stated, a man by the name of Dell Little. Dell was the first manager, general manager, of the Raisin Bargaining Association. And it was under his leadership that most of the raisin bargaining work had been done at the time the survey was run. We talked to Mr. Little, and we finally managed to convince him that he should come with NFO to head up our specialty crops division. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Dell Little, and let him tell you a little bit about himself and his work with the Raisin Bargaining Group. Mr. Little? Thank you, Gordon Schaefer. It's 
certainly my pleasure to appear here on this program with you and to be a part of this tremendous movement across our nation to help our farm people secure a cost of production plus a reasonable profit, which as I understand, and I'm sure you do, is the basic fundamental principle upon which the National Farmers Organization was founded. The success story that I have to tell you about the Raisin Bargaining Association of the San Joaquin Valley in California is one that I'm very proud to report to you because it's a success story that was accomplished by farm people themselves. It was my pleasure to be their general manager and to work with them during this period and I take great pride in the fact that we were successful. Let me just briefly say that in the fall of 1966, the raisin producers of California had, as usual, signed open price contracts with their packers. The previous two years, the packers had paid the growers $250 a sweatbox ton for their raisins as they come into the packing plants. They had promised in 1966 to uh, pay the grower another $250 a ton, which was apparently satisfactory to the growers at that time. However, as after the raisins were delivered, some of them were actually packed and possibly even consumed by you and I as consumers, the packers no, uh, indicated that they would settle for $230 or cut $20 from the grower's uh, return. And this $20, of course, as you can appreciate, is many times the mar margin of profit. So in the fall of 1966, the growers banded together and determined to organize a nonprofit farm cooperative under the laws of the state of California. And we incorporated on December 30th, 1966. We opened our office uh, the following uh, March and proceeded uh, to enroll members. And on the 1st of June, and I'm briefing this very brief, we had some 70,000 tons of raisins um, blocked together with 1,026 growers. And we stopped enrollment at that time because we had the big problem ahead of us of selling the 70,000 tons of raisins. We proceeded during the next four or five months to, to, to negotiate a contract with 11 major packers, raisin packers in the Fresno area and succeeded eventually in signing these packers to two-year sales contracts in which they agreed to buy all of the raisins that we had blocked together from the growers whom they had been previously servicing. To brief the story even further, we, after much negotiations, and this was a tough battle, and I'm very proud to uh, say that the growers stuck together 100%, and this, of course, is basic and fundamental to successful collective bargaining. The price that we finally agreed upon in 1967 for the entire free tonnage crop of raisins out of the valley was $305 per sweat box ton or $75 over the previous year. The grower who had invested 50 cents per ton in a membership agreement had now a return of $75 per ton to uh, take to the bank and enjoy himself and pay off his debts. This to me is a success story that I'm extremely, as I said before, proud of. This was a gain of 32% over the previous year. Now, the following year, we succeeded in signing additional members, increased our tonnage to 90,000 tons, and proceeded to increase the price that the grower received for his free tonnage raisins to uh, $312 for the 1968 crop. This is the present price that all growers are receiving for their raisins. And we know that we have returned to the grower well in excess of seven million dollars uh, money that he would not have had before and i maintain that this is a success story that any group of growers can accomplish if they will stick together and if you multiply that seven million dollars gordon by the seven times that we know represents the true relationship uh, of a dollar sales on behalf of an agricultural commodity and as it uh, works its way through the economy of our nation, it increases seven times. And again, may I say I'm proud of this story. 
Well, thank you, Dale. That uh, certainly is a success story, and we appreciate your being here to tell it for us today. As you know, we are here today to talk about potato bargaining. When you think about potatoes, a lot of farmers not realizing that potatoes are as important a crop as they are, may think that these potato crops are maybe perhaps not as important as they actually are. But to many farmers, potatoes are important. They're all that many farmers produce. And of course, they are a sizable crop when you think of the crop in relation to the amount of money that's involved. Might be interesting to note the various uses for potatoes. We find, according to government statistics, that in 1967, approximately 39% of the potatoes produced in the United States were used for the fresh market. Now, this would amount to nearly 30 million bags, 100 weight bags, of potatoes. Now, besides the fresh market, of course, we have a seed market, which is a relatively small market, something like uh, 230,000 sacks. In addition to this, our other big market is the food processing market that use about 34 million bags in 1967. And then what we call our non-food market, which of course is the starch uh, plant and livestock feed. These together consumed approximately 12,500,000 bags of potatoes in 1969. The non-fresh market using about 61 percent of the total supply of potatoes. And we might look for just a minute to see where these potatoes are grown. Idaho, we find, is our biggest producer of potatoes, producing nearly 30 percent of the total crop in the United States. Next to Idaho, we find the Red River Valley probably running second, with something like 15% of the total crop. This includes, of course, the states of Minnesota, North Dakota, some in South Dakota. The third largest producing area is the state of Maine, where they produce approximately 11% of the total crop. Then we find the balance of what you might call the Northwest area, including Washington, Oregon and California coming about fourth area-wise in production, and they produce about 10% of the total crop. Now, in addition to these major producing areas, we have other states such as New York, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Colorado, and some others that are considered to be major producing areas. So we find that potato production is, like a lot of other crops, it's pretty widely scattered over the United States. Now, Dale, since uh, you have only recently come with us, I believe that I will take the time here to discuss a little bit of the history, NFO's history in potato bargaining. To go back about uh, a year ago, or perhaps just a little more than a year ago now, we began to find a lot of interest among our members out in the various areas who were potato producers in trying to get together blocks of potatoes and bargain for a better price. And of course, at this time, we found prices were very low. Last April, which uh, is not quite a year ago now, we had our first what you might call a potato meeting here in Corning, Iowa, where our NFO members from all of these areas, which I mentioned above, uh, gathered to discuss the problem. Some of the fellows, incidentally, uh, who did come to that potato meeting, and this is only just a few, but we had uh, Willie Edwards from California, John LaRue from Colorado, 
and Del Ray Holm and Kent Remington from Idaho, and Glenn Manuel from Maine, Harold Smith from New Jersey, Bruce Nichols from Oregon, Larry Anderson from Washington, and quite a group of, in addition to these that I have named. Now, <clears throat> when they came together here, there was considerable discussion about the prices that were then being paid for potatoes over the various areas. And we found that potatoes were bringing from 75 cents to a dollar, and in some cases, perhaps just a little bit more per hundred. After much discussion, the members assembled decided that we should go back to the various areas and concentrate our efforts in organizing more production into an NFO block. Now, <clears throat> The members were going to go back home and talk with the members that couldn't come about the cost of production. They were going to have meetings and they were going to work on what it actually cost to produce an acre of potatoes in their area, or to break it down further, a hundred pounds of potatoes. They were going to talk about the going price of potatoes in their area. They were going to try to show the members that actually the prices they were receiving were below the cost of production. Then they were going to try to urge these members to organize, to get out and talk to the, to the neighbors that were not members of NFO yet about the possibility of bringing potatoes together for block bargaining and selling. In August, we had a second meeting. Some of these same fellows and some more came together in, uh, in August to discuss the progress that had been made and to further discuss the problem and what NFO thought could be done about the problem. Again, we had many hours of discussion. It was brought out in this discussion that probably our principal problem actually was with the grade B or the and the cull potatoes. The grade B, in case some of you don't know what we're talking about, is the smaller potato that's still sound. It's usable. It's a very valuable potato, actually, to the processing industry. But it's a potato that no one had been receiving anything for, so far as the farmers were concerned. We actually found that our producers were receiving as little as 10 cents a hundred down to 10 cents a ton and in some areas our producers were actually paying the processors as much as 10 cents a hundred to haul these potatoes out of the cellars to their processing plants bear in mind that once they got them to the processing plants these same potatoes were just as valuable in many cases to the processor as what we might call a number one fresh potato. So we found that it was really a situation where the processor was actually getting his product to process from the members for nothing. Most cases, just practically nothing. As a result, we proposed and FO members assembled at this second meeting in August proposed that when they started digging the fall crop, they dispose of the grade B potatoes. Now these, bear in mind, are the ones that never had brought them anything anyway. Well, some of the boys, when they went back home from Corning, began to promote this plan more vigorously than others. In the state of Oregon, and in the northern part of California, our members very actively promoted this program. And when they started to dig, they opened up the chains on their digging machines and let these grade B potatoes drop back on the ground. Now, of course, this eliminated the grade Bs. Now, when the boys in Idaho learned that this was what the boys in Oregon were doing, 
Well, they got together and decided that although most of their potatoes were dug and were already in their cellars, they would not sell the grade B potato, and therefore the grade Bs were also eliminated from the market in the state of Idaho. Now, this meant that the processors on the West Coast uh, were drastically short of grade B potatoes, or processing potatoes. Immediately, they began to try to buy potatoes. And it wasn't long until they were offering as much as a dollar and a quarter per hundred for these grade B potatoes, the same potatoes that they had been getting for nothing. The offer was first made in Oregon. When they found that there was no grade B potatoes available, then they went to Idaho, where they offered as much as a dollar and 75 cents per hundred for grade B potatoes. The Idaho producers got together and decided not to ship potatoes out of the state. So then they tried Colorado. And finally, they were bidding as much again as a dollar and 75 cents a hundred with the apparent intention of transporting these, shipping these potatoes back to the West Coast for processing. Now, it wasn't that there was no potatoes to be bought in Oregon. Potatoes were available. But what apparently they wanted to do was to move a quantity of potatoes into the Oregon area, thereby forcing down the Oregon market. Well, Gordon, I think that is a tremendous success story for the National Farmers Organization. It certainly compares with the story that I told you uh, we enjoyed in California with the Raisin Bargaining Association. Just to review that again, here's a fact that the potatoes have been raised in price from 10 cents to as high as $1.75 per hundredweight for grade B potatoes. And I, in fact, know, uh, Mr. Schaefer, of a producer who has sold the grade B potatoes that are now in his warehouse at $2 per hundred weight. That's real success in my book. Dale, as we said earlier, we planned to get together at the National Convention in December in St. Louis and make further plans for a bargaining effort on potatoes. Now, I know you were not yet with us, but I also know that you have familiarized yourself with the program which was adopted at St. Louis, and I'd like for you to take a few minutes to go over the major points of this program for us. Well, thank you again. The group of growers who got together then at the National Convention in St. Louis in December 1968 uh, outlined a number of objectives that they had that they intended to put into practice during the coming and ensuing year, and we are following this program at the present time. I'm going to read it, uh, on a, a couple of the items at any rate, so that you will get the real deep significance of this program. Number one, NFO will make an all-out effort to get processors and handlers of potatoes to pay the cost of production, plus a reasonable profit to NA NFO producers for all potatoes used. Number two, NFO will work for a minimum price, net to the grower of $2 per hundredweight field run with a maximum of 50% number one grade potatoes with the local areas bargaining above this figure for the best price obtainable. Now where this pricing formula does not work, NFO will work for a minimum price for US number one potatoes of $3 per hundred weight net to the grower. Now another item is number NFO will make available to its members a potato sales agreement under which NFO members will be urged to sign for the sale of their potatoes through the NFO uh, bargaining process to the processing plants. NFO will work for an equalized storage payment for better reflecting, so that it might better reflect the cost of storage and shrinking. And another item, NFO will work toward getting potatoes removed from the futures market because people quite frankly, with money, are playing the futures market and disrupting the potato market 
so that the legitimate potato grower is having difficult, difficulty, shall we say, getting a reasonable price for his raisins. And so it was decided that uh, NFO would immediately prepare a potato sales agreement through which our members could group their production. We would also prepare supply contracts which could be signed with processing plants. The uh, program then, both for the balance of the 1968 crop, which was still on hands, and for the coming crop of 1969, was that we would use our potato sales agreements and block together our production, then go to the processing industry and offer this for sale at the quoted price, as you mentioned there, $2 uh, per hundred for, uh, I can't quote exactly, but it was uh, for number... Uh, U.S. number one. U.S. Uh, Dell, I believe it was for the uh, field run potatoes with 50% or more number ones. That's correct, Gordon. Yes. I'm sorry, I made an error. Well, now, since the convention, can you tell us briefly, I see we're about to run out of time, uh, what the program has accomplished? Well, fine. Since that time, of course, our growers have continued to sign sales agreements for their 1968 crop as well as for the 1969 crop. And, of course, our big success with regard to the supply contract was our first NFO supply contract signed with a potato buyer in Idaho, which represented $210, correction, I'm in the potato industry now, $2.10 per hundred field run potatoes, that is 50% number ones. And this uh, contract also had a clause, an incentive clause for quality, so that some of our growers, uh, Gordon, actually received $2.80 per hundred under that contract. Well, fine. Now, uh, the NFO is continuing since this first contract to sign additional contracts, and I believe that uh, subsequent contracts have been signed, almost everyone, at a little bit higher price. So it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that today uh, in Idaho, our members have been receiving as much as $3.50 per hundred for the potatoes which were signed under a sales agreement and sold through our supply contracts, which were field-run potatoes with 50 cents minimum number one potatoes. Now, I think that there's no reason why other areas could not do the same thing that uh, Idaho has been doing. In Maine, for example, I understand that we now have 75% of all of the potato producers in Maine signed into NFO. They are now beginning to group their production together and expect to proceed in bargaining the same as we're doing in Idaho. And other areas, in all commodities, for that matter, can and will be doing the same thing. Absolutely. U.S. Farm Report has presented Potato Bargaining with Gordon Schaefer, Chief Negotiator for the National Farmers Organization, and Del Little, Head of NFO Specialty Crops. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's true prosperity level, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture. <laughs>